This is the GTN Show, welcome. This week, we are dreaming. Okay, I need to reword that slightly. I mean, we're goal setting as we discuss bucket list races that both us and the pros get very excited about. Yes, and we've also got an extremely packed race schedule to talk about. A lot of your photos now that everyone seems to be training and racing, plus news of a court case that has been resolved for a pro triathlete. Well, the race season has well and truly exploded this weekend, as you'll find out when we get to race news shortly. And we are spoiled in triathlon. I mean, the range and number of races that we can either watch or participate in. Maybe it was an iconic race that you heard about before you even did triathlon that got you into the sport. Or maybe as you've progressed through your triathlon career, it's those races that you hear about from other people that keep you motivated and wanting to go on. Yeah, I mean, I think as triathletes, we're always driven by goals and different aspirations we might want to go further or a bit faster or do something a bit bigger when we're racing our next event. It might be that we might want to switch up terrain even and do something like cross tri triathlon and short course distance or at the other end of the extreme we've got all sorts of endurance aspects of our already endurance sport. Things like Deca Ironman even which to me seems a bit mad. Yeah I mean that is crazy but it isn't always necessarily about pushing yourself to your extreme limit. It could be a race that maybe attracts you because of its location or maybe even its history. I mean for example this weekend coming up there's the Escape from Alcatraz which is a pretty iconic race. It's on my bucket list I know that. <laughs> I mean as much as I don't like cold water I still it's the history of that of jumping into the freezing cold water in San Francisco Bay off a boat swimming away from this notorious prison and just yeah the whole sort of nostalgia around that is really cool but then on the other side of things um, I think it's location I really want to race in New Zealand whether that's New Zealand um, Ironman or whether that's Challenge Wanaka I mean one day hopefully I'll get to do this what, what about you Fraser? Yeah I mean I agree with both those because I haven't done any of those either Heather but for me um, I mean I was lucky I did get to race in lots of different places but there was one that I did go and watch which was Ironman France in Nice um, never did it but just thought wow this is a really cool race it's a beautiful location one big loop on the bike for example which is really quite unusual these yeah. days you get to run up down the Promenade dos Anglais, which is quite famous stripper road in Nice down there. So yeah, it's just one of those races that if I could, might go back and give it a try. Uh, well, next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> need to keep you, keep you going now you're an age group, uh, Fraser. Yeah, so those targets are important. I'm not sure about all this Ironman <laughs> malarkey. <laughs> but anyway, enough about what we want to do. We've actually gone and caught up with the pros. So Mark's been out in Samarin at the Challenge Championship to find out what their bucket list race is. Bucket list race I could recommend is uh, Laguna Phuket Triathlon. At the end of the year, it's always a fantastic party afterwards in a, in a perfect surrounding. It's usually the end of the season and I would say this is a uh, pretty good way to, to finish a, a year. Well, I'm doing trial and draw for the first time in five weeks. And yeah, it's one of the big sort of bucket list races that we have in the sport and yeah. Yeah, it's like they said here, the Challenge Daytona, it's a very cool race uh, on the track. So yeah, maybe that one. Really, like I love the championship races, like the championship here, I love uh, world championships, half iron, uh, ITU, anything, relay, so anything with uh, high stakes and you know that usually brings out a good crowd, uh, big prize purse, uh, just makes it a little bit more pressure and just more exciting overall. I want to start Enduro World Series, <laughs> but it's probably not going to happen and um, uh, I think also when I've finally would do it, it would scare the out of me and then I wouldn't DN, DNS probably. <laughs> um, my personal favourite actually isn't a triathlon, it's the London Marathon. I just think that um, you've got thousands of people the whole way along the course and really in triathlon there isn't a race that's that well supported. Um, so yeah, if you could do a mainstream marathon, I would recommend it. I mean Kona, it's got to be Kona really, like you can have a great holiday thereafter as well and yeah, you're not really going to get an atmosphere like that. Right, well, we had quite a selection there from the pros over in Samurai, and we're unfortunately not going to be able to chat about nearly all of them. But no surprises to me, at least, that Kona made the cut because, well, it's just such an iconic event. But there are other races in there too that don't require qualification. And there are quite a lot of races now that have just got so popular because of, say, the atmosphere at the event. And one that, well, maybe isn't quite as well known outside of Europe, but just madly sought after within Europe, certainly, is Challenge Roth. It's just one of those crazy races that people actually 
to make an effort to go to the year before to be there on site to get advanced um, registration, don't they? Yeah, it's mad. I should add that to my bucket list as yeah, well, do. I think. Well, you probably can guess where we're going with this. We want to know what your bucket list race or races are. So it's time for this week's GTN poll. But obviously, we've had to restrict it to four, which has been pretty tough in the first place. So don't shout at me. I have made the list. You might see the influence here. But there is an option for other as well. So here we go. We've got um, option one, Escape from Alcatraz. Option two, Kona. Alp Duez as option three, Challenge Roth as option four, or if it's not any of those and it's a different one, then click on other, but make sure you let us know in the comment section below which it is, and to enter that poll, just click on the link up here. And talking about polls, that means that we can chat about the results from last week's poll, where we asked, what do you think is the problem with triathlon? So we got quite a well, varied response, I suppose. Our um, least um, impressive answer was, it's too addictive, with just 2%. Nothing, I love triathlon the way it is, going yeah. down with um, 13%. I was hoping that would be a bit higher. <laughs> I clicked on that one. <laughs> um, and, then, and, and then, to be fair, I don't see any surprises with um, our top two results. Time in at 27%, it's so just over a quarter there, but the bulk of it, at 54%, people felt the problem was the cost and the travel. Yeah, and there was a lot of comments that actually related to that. So, you know, hopefully the more events there are, the less distance you have to travel, and hopefully we can you know, get more people doing triathlons so the cost can come down. Yeah, absolutely. Now, moving on to our try news. And first up is a story about wild swimmers possibly having a bit of a backlash against uh, British Triathlon, effectively, who have teamed up with the Royal Life Saving Society in an effort to accredit swim venues for potential use for open water events. But the problem being that a minimum temperature that's imposed for swimming by British Triathlon is 11 degrees. Yeah, and there's a lot of evidence out there that while swimming in water colder than that can actually be really good for your health. So while swimmers are concerned that this could start to reduce the, the places or the chances of doing wild swimming. Now British Triathlon obviously had that rule in play for racing, but it looks like it could be slightly confusing that if these venues do become accredited, which is great for triathlon because more places to do the event, it could in theory mean that outside of competition, swimmers are maybe still not allowed to swim if the water's colder than 11. I personally wouldn't be swimming under 11, but obviously in a triathlon race and you've got a set distance as well, and wild swimmers often just jump in the water to, sure. to get those health benefits. You don't have to swim very far to enjoy open water swimming, so to speak. No, so there is a, a, a slight concern from the wild swimming organisations that through the winter time, when an awful lot of people are more than happy to go swimming in open water venues when they've no, nothing to do with racing, that they aren't going to be able to do that, potentially. Yeah, but I think they have been said at the moment that these rules should only hopefully be in place during the season. So hopefully it's going to be a win-win for everybody and we'll get to have more triathlon venues and wild swimming and open water swimming can continue to grow because it has um, grown in this country anyway exponentially. I think there were 300 members of the open water swimming society back in I think um, 2008 or sometime 2006 and now there's 70,000 members. Wow so, that's massive. So yeah I think we need to go and get out there and get in enjoying our summer anyway pretty soon. But in other news there's been a positive outcome from a court case for a pro triathlete Els Visser. Now she was first across the line at Ironman Maastricht last year and then six weeks after the race got disqualified, got her Dutch title taken away, got her prize money taken off her and this was all because herself and Sonia Bracegirdle took a wrong boy or went round the, the wrong way on the swim course. I don't think it was even a significant amount and apparently there was obviously a petition and it should have been all decided within 24 hours but it wasn't. Yeah and this is the crux of the um, court case as far as we're aware because Dutch media reports suggesting that effectively Ironman didn't follow their own protocols and you know regulations in that instance and as Heather said within 24 hours that should have been one way or the other um, uh, you know validated I suppose and, and it wasn't and it's um, six weeks down the line before the um, result was actually overturned and that's essentially the, the crux of how Els Vissers has actually or her legal team have managed to win yeah. this case isn't it but then it had um, more of a knock on effect than that because it was actually the Dutch Championships so Yvonne van Verken will, who got the title will now sadly have lost her title but also further down the line this race sort of it got quite a lot of press because Angela Nath the Canadian athlete finished I think just off the podium mm -hmm. or it was one slot basically below a Kona qualification and then six weeks after uh, well, this disqualification it bumped her up so just before Kona yeah, it, was uh, it was pretty close. She found out she had a qualification slot and she ended up going to the World Championships and finishing eighth. So, I mean, she did well from this situation and thankfully Elsvisa has at last been uh, rewarded it, but obviously it is a little bit late, but at least hopefully it means it won't happen in the future. Yeah, and definitely not the way that she wanted to get that win back, is it? Mm. 
Now, finally moving on to a little bit of tech news about a new training app called Final Surge. Now, it is a daily training platform, much like others that are on the marketplace. And a lot like those others, it's free to use if you just want to use it for your analytics. Um, interestingly though, it has just won the best training app award. Well, this coincides nicely with Polar, who've just updated and now actually incorporated .fit files, which means that with Final Surge, you can actually link directly your Polar flow, so you can analyze your data on that as well as Polar if you want to. And this is just another thing that Polar have done, having recently had the ANT Plus update for their OH1 and their H10. So it's exciting to see new developments and you know, channels working together. Now on to our race news, and first up is the I2 European Championships from Veert in Holland. And this saw the return to racing of double Olympic gold medalist Alistair Brownlee, who was looking to add to the last time he won this event, which was back in 2014 at Kitzbühel in Austria. Now out of the water, there was a league group of five athletes that included Brownlee, and this very quickly was swelled to 10 athletes, and this fast moving group took an advantage of nearly a minute into T2, which essentially was gonna secure the medals. And indeed, Brownlee surged clear and very quickly had a commanding gap over fellow breakaway rider Martin Van Riel from Belgium, who looked set to hold on to silver until a very fast running Jao Pereira from Portugal ran through to take that silver medal. And in fact, Van Riel faded so badly that he had that bronze medal snatched from him from compatriot Jelly Greens. Now there was no defending champion in this year's race in Holland, so that meant once a well-organized group of nearly 20 athletes formed, it was highly likely that this year's champion was gonna come from that group. Now there was a mix of nations represented, but most notably it included Beth Potter from the UK, who represented the UK at the Rio Olympic Games on the track over 10,000 meters. So you would assume that she was the winner that was likely to come from this group. And in fact, that proved to be the case. Once they hit T2 and started the run, there was no looking back for Potter and although athletes gave chase the likes of Sandra Dodi from France and Claire Michel from Belgium worked very hard it was a phenomenal run split of 33-23 that took Potter to the win with Sandra Dodi from France second and Claire Michel from Belgium holding on for third. Now moving on to long course racing and there was a whole host of the sport's biggest stars racing somewhere or the other around the globe this weekend but by far the strongest field assembled was that of the Samarin Challenge Championship event in Slovakia. And on the men's racing, we had American short course non-drafting star Ben Knut leading out of the water, but he was very soon passed by Belgian's Peter Hemerich on the bike, who would then go on to average a mind-boggling 47 kilometers an hour over his bike split to take a lead of varying distances over the top 10 chasers into T2, including a two minute 40 margin over former world champion Sebi Keenly. But he did seem to have a point to prove, having come second in the previous two editions of this race. And indeed, in his own words, he said that that was possibly the best run of my career managing to claw back all of that time and pass Hemerich in the final two Ks of the run to win by a 32 second margin from Peter Hemerich in second and America's Rodolfi von Berg took third. Now on the women's side of racing, it was Lucy Charles Barkley who was able to go on to take her third victory here in Slovakia by virtue of a gun to tape dominating performance which she started with a two minute lead that she took out of the water. And she only served to further cement this race winning margin over the world class field during the bike ride. However, behind her, it was multiple Ironman 70.3 champion, Czech athlete Radka Kalafelt, who was able to use her running prowess to charge through the field to get her into second place. And Challenge Roth winner from 2018, Daniela Blemhill was able to hold on for third. Now, in Europe, we also had two very big Ironman 70.3 events, which were actually both won by reigning Ironman 70.3 world champions. And starting up, we had Ironman 70.3 Switzerland in Rappersville, where Daniela Rith took the victory in what is her home 70.3 event. And we had American Sky Wench taking second thanks to a race best half marathon split with German athlete Svenja Toes rounding out the podium in third. Now on the men's side of racing, we had a very fast ride from Andy Bocherer who took himself into a joint lead with his compatriot Niels Fromhold by T2. They held a very comfortable three minute buffer over home favorite Swiss athlete Sven Riederer. However, Fromhold faded very badly on the run and it was actually Spaniard Pablo de Pina who was able to charge through to take second place over hauling Sven Riederer who held on to third with Andy Bocherer taking that victory at Ironman 70.3 Switzerland. 
Now, moving over to Kreischkauf 70.3 in Germany, we also had an Ironman 70.3 winner as champion. And in this case, it was Jan Frodeno from Germany, who was actually doing his first Ironman event since claiming that title in South Africa last September after a very long injury layoff. Now, by T2, he had taken a three minute buffer over early swim leader, Lukas Wout from Poland. But he had then managed to extend this at the finish line by another nine minutes to have a 12 minute buffer over second place athlete, his compatriot, German Paul Dirksmeyer, who in turn was just in front of that early swim leader, Lukas Vogt from Poland in third. Moving on to the women's racing, we had an equally dominant affair in terms of gun to tape racing from Hella Fredriksson from Denmark, who exited the water shoulder to shoulder with some other athletes, but never looked back once she got on her bike, taking a solo victory from that point onwards. She was in front of a Belgian pair of athletes with Alexandra Tondur taking silver and Katrina Verstuft in third. Now switching continents to Asia, and we also had an Ironman 70.3 there at Subic Bay in the Philippines. And this was also won by an Ironman 70.3, or former champion, should I say, Tim Reed from Australia. Now he took this victory from fellow compatriot Tim Van Berkel, and third place went to Nick Baldwin from the Seychelles. On the women's side of racing, we had a victory for Swiss star and veteran of the sport, Carolyn Steffen, and she took that from second place Australian athlete Dimitri Lee Duke, and third place was Laura Wood from New Zealand. Now we had racing on the North American continent too, and this weekend it was an Ironman 70.3 Victoria in Canada. And on the men's side of racing, we had Sam Long from the US taking his maiden victory at this level of racing, spoiling the home party with Canadian athletes Cody Beals in second and Taylor Reed in third. And talking of home athletes, it was Canadian Paula Finley who was leading the race until midway through the run, but unfortunately had to pull out due to an injury, paving the way for former World Ironman 70.3 champion Miranda Carfrey to take the win with a very fleet-footed 122 half marathon, taking that victory in front of Heather Vertel from Canada and her fellow compatriot Jenna Nett in third. Now then, there was Xterra racing on both the Asian and European continents this past weekend. And first up that we're gonna talk about is Xterra Tahiti, which in the men's racing was a complete clean sweep from the French, with Brice de Boer taking the win from Cedric Fleurton in second, and recent Xterra Greece champion, Arthur Serriers rounding out the podium in third. Moving on to the women's race, well, that was won by the sole female professional entrant in Karina Wazel from Austria. But not to take anything away from her victory, because this was her 23rd career Xterra win. It's now time to take a look at your photos. And we've got a great selection in, although even though I'm saying it's race season, we're starting indoors with this first one from Yoav, and he has sent it in from Jerusalem Which, in Israel. Yeah, and it's just a really nice little picture, isn't it? Because Yoav's only 15 and he's put in his pain cave picture there of his bike on his turbo, and he says he's getting ready already for the Israeli Triathlon Championship this coming October. So you're getting lots of training in Yoav, and he just says, love the channel, and love watching it in every single one of my pain cave rides. Nice. Well, on his Albea Onyx and he's got his tax trainer set up. Minnie Mouse giving him a little bit of support in the corner as well. Can't forget her. Um, and looks like he's into his music. Yeah, playing some of the guitars, Minnie, maybe, perhaps. But next up we've got Trevor who has sent a very funny little story and a picture to go with it of him um, going out on his Aero road bike, his Scott... Oh, what is it? Scott, Scott Foyle. Foyle. Yeah, sorry. And he says, luckily with 28 mil Schwalbe one tires. And he means luckily because he turned up for what he thought was the great road ride, but it was actually scheduled to be a mountain bike ride. So his trusty 28 mil tires managed to get him through the ride, apparently. And he said he loved it. I mean, that's got to be some pretty good skill as well, because it looks like it's a little bit muddy there. And yeah, it's quite sliding. But I'm more impressed by the GTN kit. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up for that one. Good work. I like Saturday it. Saturday morning in and around the Adelaide Hills, he says. Nice. Well, our next one comes in from Carrie, and it's her Planet X, and she, this is from Valkensvard. Yeah, she um, was at the, at the European Championships just this weekend in, in Veert, in Holland. Oh, nice. So I wonder very, where Valkensvard um, was. Maybe. Very um, uh, topical, is the word I'm looking for. So, hope you had a good race, Carrie. Yeah, nice one. And next up, we've got a couple pictures that have come in from Gabor, and also very topical, because it was this weekend past as well, at the Samarin race, where Mark was out getting all sorts of videos and content, and um, Gabor's got a picture, firstly in transition, of his giant TCR Advanced, and on it he's got some Vision 35 wheels, he's got specialised aero bars, and as he says, at the Exponix Sphere there in Samarin. And um, yeah, that's his transition setup ready to go. 
Now he says actually he got a, I think, personal best in the run and the bike, but it might have been partly to do with the swim being slightly different because it was so cold out in the River Danube yeah. that the, for the age groupers, they swam in a swimming pool. I mean, luckily there was loads of great facilities at um, San Marino where they could do that, but um, so yeah, the swim got moved from a river into a pool. And it looks... Maybe that saves a little bit of energy to help him get that personal best. Yeah, and it seems awfully strange that they didn't get to swim in that river, given how lovely it looks in that picture, doesn't it? I know, and I'm sure Mark has managed to top up that farmer's <laughs> town. No doubt we'll see when he's back. But we love seeing those places where you're out racing, whether it's even just training or whatever wonderful photos of your bike. So do make sure you carry on sharing them with us using the GTN uploader. Yeah, and that brings us on to the GTN caption competition. And last week's picture is one of an old teammate of mine, actually, Thomas St young Austrian who'd had a really great race at Ironman 70.3 Sam Poulton but yeah and you wouldn't think that he'd done really well judging by this picture would you? No and your caption suggestions definitely reflect that we've rounded it down to four this week and our first runner up comes from Joe Briley no I forgot to start my watch not on Strava doesn't count uh, is, I think we all know that feeling yeah, that's a good point um, Yannick says uh, basically everyone after watching the finale of Game of Thrones which Hands up, I, yeah. I don't really Apparently get Apparently it was a bit of an anti-climax. Yeah, we're, we're I mean, don't, we're not, we're not I think quite a few of you guys know because there were quite a few captions along those suggestions. <laughs> Next we've got um, Benjamin LGD it says, I wish I had a GTN swim cap to cover that hair. <laughs> I like it, clever. Yeah, it's a good one. Almost there. <laughs> um, uh, a close win for um, Cap this week goes to Mr. Matty725 who says, oh no, the finish isn't open yet, which I quite like, I think that's funny, so. So yeah, send in you your get details. Fraser's vote and you get the cap. <laughs> <laughs> well done there. Well, this week for your chance to win one of our GTN swim caps, we've got this picture of Mark <laughs> looking larger than life, um, out to challenge Sam Marin. And I mean, who knew Patrick Langer was racing? No, I had no idea, not this weekend anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I know these pro triathletes are pretty small, but. It does look tiny, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully Mark has actually come back with some real life interviews. We, we have our fingers crossed, but let us know your caption suggestions in the comments section below. Now, as we are filming this right now, Mark is winging his way back from the Samarin Championship in Slovakia. But do keep an eye out for lots more videos from him. And that's it for us for this week's GTN show. Yeah, but before you go, do check out the link for our GTN shop because we've got caps. If you're not good enough to win one in caps competition, you can go and buy them yourself or any of the other GTN kit you see us wearing. And if you've enjoyed it, hit the thumb up and don't forget to subscribe by clicking on the globe to make sure you get all of our videos. And just a few days ago, we made a video on mental health within triathlon. If you want to check that out, it's got the pro Sarah True, that's just down here. And if you want to see a video that's already come out from the Challenge Championship where Mark did the Challenge Championship in numbers, you can get that here.